So I've spent this week eating way too much candy corn. Like here in the U.S., you know, Halloween's a big thing. Like candy corn is a traditional little candy. Does anyone else have this anywhere, or is this like a totally just U.S. thing? They're just little like sugary corn-shaped things, but they're super addictive. Nom, nom, nom. Yeah, my, my girlfriend's from Poland. She had never seen them before, so I'm, I'm thinking they're probably just a weird U.S. thing. Okay, well, there's a few folks here. I guess I can we can go ahead and get started. Uh, so, how's everyone been doing? Hopefully, hopefully well. Um, I'm trying to think like what is what is new to talk about this week, just to give a status update. Um, so the 1.7.10 Ballistica build it should be available for everyone now. Like I I got it out on Google Play and um, you know there's test builds on the site. So if you you know if you don't have access through Google Play, just grab that. As always, it's just ballistica.net, and then you go to the downloads page. Uh, so there's 1.7.10 test builds there if anyone wants to play with those. Um, also, finally, uh, I got the Amazon version. I don't know if any of you guys would have the Amazon <laughs> version, but I finally got that version updated. It's only at 1.7.9, but um, it's been stuck on like 1.5 or something like that for like a year or two. So I finally, finally got that version updated. It was sitting in review for like two weeks though. That's the funny thing with these, you know, app store stuff is some of them like you submit something to the store and then it sits there and gets reviewed for, you know, anywhere from like a day to like weeks sometimes, I guess, depending on how busy they are or something. So it took about like two weeks to get the Amazon version like through review. And then something else funny happened with the Google version. I don't know, maybe some of you saw this in chat where, uh, my 1.7.10 update got rejected actually because it was mentioning some uh, like misleading text in the app description and it turned out it was like weird mundane stuff like it was saying like in, in the Russian description like the last line said like fight because that's how, like what the description is if you see it on the store it's like you know play with your friends bomb your friends blow each other up have fun fight um, but for some reason they didn't like that fight at the end, so I got an email from Google saying like, your app has been rejected because it says fight. So I'm curious if that was uh, like some sort of weird like machine learning automated thing where like it was like a false positive. Um, Cause that, that just seems like a weird thing to reject something for. So I, I wound up taking that line out and just resubmitting it and then it went through, but I did a, like a minor update after that, like a, a slightly updated 1.7.10 and that one got rejected again but for a different reason saying like the the description in english uh it says like bombs away at the end like in that same spot and so it, like for some reason they rejected it for saying bombs away so it, that made me think it must be like you know some weird ai thing or you know something because a, a human couldn't do that uh, so I, I appealed that and after like two hours they got back to me and they're like oh okay yeah it's actually fine so it must have been some weird mistake. Um, so the update went through uh, finally, but it was just yeah, it was kind of interesting because none of all of those like descriptions on the store um, like have not changed in like probably almost ten years at this point. So it's weird that you know just a week ago suddenly they started <laughs> picking up on things. Because yeah, it complained about like fight in Russian and bombs away in. Uh, the U.S. English translation, and then there was one other one where it was like Dutch. Apparently, the that last line, like someone you know submitted that translation for me a long time ago, but the last line apparently translated to like shooting or something, which that like maybe maybe it's a word that means you know like fight or whatever. Maybe maybe that doesn't come through clearly cleanly, but like that one was weird. So like why would it say shooting at the end? So I took that line out. That was the one that seemed like okay maybe that is misleading. <laughs> Because there's no shooting in the game. It's just fighting and bombing. But anyway, random little story. Uh, so anyway, 1.7.10 is all, um, you know, again, that's online. 
decent amount of like internal changes in there, uh, stuff with like the, you know, connectivity. So you know things like if you're using the cloud console, you know you should always be able to, you know that like reconnect and stuff. If uh, if the game's been running for a while, you should like still be able to use cloud console and things like that. Uh, that was kind of there were issues before. I mentioned this last week where like after 20 minutes or so, the game like refreshes its connection to the you know cloud servers but it wouldn't actually like log in again. So after 20 minutes, like things like Cloud Console would stop working, um, but that should all be you know, 100% behaving itself in 1.7.10 now. So if you see any weird connectivity issues or anything else in 1.7.10, please, please holler and we'll, we'll get those fixed. Uh, let's see, what else is new this week? Uh, it's kind of a nerdy thing, but I, I wound up con uh, switching Auto formatters for my my code. If you go to ballistica.net and go to wiki, I wrote a little blurb about it just because it was kind of interesting. Um, so I'm a huge fan of auto formatting. So basically, you know, when you're writing Python code, just not having to worry about you know indentation and things like that and spacing and all that stuff. Uh, so basically, on the entire project. I just have it all automatically get formatted with you know an auto formatter. Um, I find it just it, it's nice. You know, it's nice to not have to like think about that part. It's just something I can you know let something else take care of, and then I just worry about coding and let something else handle the formatting. Um, but for a year, like when I set this up a few years ago, I was using Yapf, which was a Google project. Um, and you know, I kind of liked it because it was very customizable. So you could you know tweak stuff like you know when it should you know make a new line and you know kind of how your code should be formatted exactly. So that was kind of cool. But uh, the downside is the project seems to be kind of you know it's on like maintenance mode or like the original writer is not you know it doesn't seem to be getting many updates. Like there's a few a few commits here in recent history. Only you know there's some in Feb, you know going back to like February. Even that is kind of a while back. Um, but the reason I started looking into this is because I was messing with, there's a new like, um, I keep wanting it to call it a switch statement, but no, it's the match statement in Python 3.7. So there's, a, there's this new statement, which is kind of like a switch statement. If any of you are familiar with like C and the switch statement, and it looks like this, if you can see this, where basically you can just have a single statement with a few different kind of value options and based on that value you can have it do something specific. So it's you know it's very similar to just writing a big like if else if else if else statement. It just kind of saves you some some writing. And plus it's actually uh, if you look at the documents here documentation here it, it's actually pretty powerful in terms of like you can do wild cards and all substitutions and you know it, it's a lot fancier than like the C switch statement. But it does work nicely as kind of a <laughs> A version of the switch statement. So, um, I I'll probably start using that for little things like when you have like an enum value where there's like four possible values to that enum, and you want to do something specific for each of them. Uh, it works well with like MyPy and like the the type checking stuff because um, if you have an enum and you don't cover all the cases, then MyPy will warn you. It's like you're not handling this case, depending on like if you write it in the right, right way. Um, I actually I added a little blurb. If, not to get nerdy about it, I added a little blurb on the like, knowledge nuggets section here in the wiki. Um, if you haven't gone through like the wiki docs, like the knowledge nuggets is just like this, it's a little page where I just tried to put kind of some random helpful Python bits, like things that I've learned or, you know, useful stuff for the project. So I, I just added one, which is <laughs> match is handy. So it just shows kind of a, a little short example of how to use the match statement. Uh, so here, like, Here's an example. If you have like this spawn position enum, which has like four four options, this is a, a quick way to, you know, let's say you want to define a value for each of those options. You, this is a quick way you can define a function and define those values. Like for each, for top right, let's return this. For top bottom left, let's return this. And the nice thing about, you know, if you're using this with like the MyPy type checking, this will uh, warn you if you're not covering all the cases. Like if there's a spawn pos dot top left two, uh, MyPy will be like, hey, you're not returning in all cases. You're, you're missing you know, top left two. So it's a good way to kind of be able to, to check your, 
check your existing code, you know, to make sure all your code is handling all those cases. Um, but anyway, getting off on a tangent there, uh, the match statement, it was completely choking under when I, my auto formatting stuff, which, as I mentioned, used to be using Yapf. So um, I couldn't use that match statement because it would like kill the auto formatter. So that was kind of a bummer because that, that match statement is part of Python 3.10, which has been out for about a year now. So it's like they should have had time to to add that uh, support for that in, but it wasn't there. So so anyway, that got me looking into Black, which is a very popular uh, Python auto formatter. And I had looked at it before, but I kind of, I decided against it because it had like no configurability, <laughs> which is kind of what it's famous for. It's the, the phrase Black comes from I think from what I read, it came from like when they, they first started making Model T Ford cars, like back in like the 1920s or whatever, it only came in black. And there was a famous phrase saying like, you can have any color you want as long as it's black. And so I think that's what, what the, the name black came from. It's basically, it, it formats your Python code in exactly one way, <laughs> like there's no configuration. Um, but looking at it, like it, it does a pretty good job. Like I don't have any major complaints with it. And looking at the project, it's like, Comparing it to Yapf, like there's so much activity, October 6th, October 10th, October 4th. So it seems to be in a much better place than, than Yapf. So long story short, um, a long story long, I should say, I switched all our auto formatting to, to use black. So what that means is if you do use, you know, if, if you're in the Ballistica project and you do like make format, like this is going to run black. And it has cool, it has emojis in the output and any, anything that has emojis in the output is cool with me. <laughs> um, but it's super fast too, so it seems like there's, there's some other benefits. So if I do, you can do make format full and format full will basically ignore, I have like this internal cache when you, some of these commands, like when you run make format, it keeps track of like if a file has been formatted and that file hasn't changed, it won't reformat it. Uh, but it looks like black kind of does that for you. <laughs> so if I do make format full, like there, it just formatted like everything. I guess that, that's all the C++ stuff, but it should have formatted the black stuff too. Let me, let me just clear that, do that again. Okay, so anyway, yeah, formatting the whole project. Somewhere there should be Python stuff in here. unless I have a bug that I need to take a look at. And also format just scripts. Oh, okay, yeah, so yeah, black must be doing some sort of caching because it goes through every 363 files in like a blink of an eye. So it must be, <laughs> it must be somehow caching, caching those results or it's just like insanely fast. But anyway, so that's that. So yeah, we're using black. You can get it really easy. Just do, um, you know, pip install black. And then, yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's, you know, random, random formatter news. Uh, any reasons for switching to black besides Yap of breaking on match statements? Uh, well, as I mentioned, the, it was largely, all right, just after looking at the states of the projects, uh, the fact that black is um, just so active, it seems like it's gonna have better tool support and like I ran into that myself too. Like I was using a, someone had written an Emacs plugin to just automatically run Yapf on your current buffer. And so I was using that, but that project itself was kind of out of date and wasn't working well. So I had to kind of like hack that to keep it working. Um, there's one for black that looks like, you know, it works flawlessly. So it's just, I would say largely because of, you know, just seems like it'll, it'll keep working better for us moving forward. Uh, the the match thing was just kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back. I'd kind of known for a while. It seemed like Yapf wasn't as popular and kind of wasn't receiving as much attention. And in a way, I do, uh, I did like some of the formatting on Yapf. It's like black does some stuff. It, it expands things out quite a bit. Like you can see here, uh, like raise in this case, it it always like puts this close parentheses on you know the next line. Like Yapf would have done something maybe more like that, you know, just keeping things, or even like that. I think Yapf might have done, you know, some slightly more compressed stuff, whereas Black spreads things out quite a bit. Um, but it's not the end of the world, and they do make a point where that does make things look better in, um, you know, like diffs or you know, 
PRs, things like that. Like in a lot of these cases, like when you're import, if you're importing multiple things, it pretty much always splits it out. If it won't fit on one line, I think black pretty much always splits it. So it's just each line with a comma at the end. And they make a point where like this, um, you know, if you're looking at a PR or a change log, like this will look nice because basically you'll see like one changed line. Whereas before, like if everything was crunched into one line here, you know, it's harder to see like what changed because like you might have a, a, a few condensed lines and then everything shuffled around a little bit. But with this, it's like you'd see like, oh, okay, this line was added or this line was removed. So certain things like that seem nice. Oh, <laughs> you're at a concert? Cool. Um, I should mention, I, I caveated a few things here with black. So um, I kept our line lengths at 80. By default, black does 88. But um, I mean, we could always switch later. Black, they, they make the argument that, you know, with 80, apparently there's a, a decent amount more like wrapping. With 88, I guess it has, you know, a bit more space. Um, so it's like we could switch to that at some point, but I'm sticking with 80 for like all the C and C++ stuff. And 80 is a pretty common uh, width. So I figured we'd stick with 80 for a while. Um, and largely also because, you know, we're trying to make this stuff workable and usable on like phones and, you know, small devices. So I figured the, the more we can kind of keep things fitting into a small space, the better. So when you're on a phone, it's like 80 characters. You can kind of see all that code, but, you know, if we get more than that, you know, some people go with like 120 or, you know, a lot, a lot longer. Back in the day, like before I kind of, you know, cleaned all the project up in the last few years, I mean, I, I didn't have any like line length. I just, <laughs> I'd write Python lines that just went on and on and on. So I think if you looked at like Bomb Squad 1.4, I don't think it had any sort of like wrapping or line length. It was just, you know, super long lines. And a lot of people, you know, this gets into a whole debate. Like, why do we need 80 character line lengths? Like, like this monitor is huge, you know, it can, <laughs> you know, you can fit anything. Uh, but um, I kind of, I, I've kind of to really start liking the fact that I can keep my windows exactly like 80 characters wide and then, you know, start to like throw several of them side by side. So, you know, it, it keeps everything very predictable where, you know, I can, I, I, I know everything's going to fit in this size so I can start to, you know, have X number of things side by side or like I said, be able to see it on a phone, things like that. So anyway, sorry, I keep rambling on <laughs> these random boring few things. So yeah, 1.7.10 is out, black is out. Um, actually, aside from that, I've been uh, fighting some more internet or more networking stuff. I mentioned to some of you that I was, you know, running into some weird issue. I think I talked about this last week where, you know, the games would connect to all my, my servers here. So, you know, all these little green dots connecting to my kind of regional servers. But then occasionally, like, some of the connections wouldn't get shut down right. And so my, my servers were, like, leaking connections. And that's still, like, happening to a degree. I, I wound up, I put, like, a, I got a work around in there where it, like, force closes the connections sometimes when they get stuck. But there's still, like, some weird side effects from that that I'm kind of dealing with. Like, you can see right now, um, looking through my server list, like, these logs, I like to keep these as clean as possible and blue. But at the moment, there's some pretty nasty amounts of red in here. And these are from just like little connections that aren't quite getting cleaned up right. I mean, it's nothing bad, but it's just like I, ugh, it pains me to look at. <laughs> so I've been trying to, uh, yeah, kind of clean up this code. All, this is a lot of like async IO, fancy schmancy Python stuff. Just trying to get it to behave 100% well. Um, so I'm kind of in the middle of that. I think I might have to take some drastic steps. Like I might have to start <laughs> running Python 3.11 on my uh, my regional servers here because the from what I'm from what I've read this problem I'm running into where it won't like disconnect I think it's uh, specific to Python 3.10 there's a specific bug that they fixed in 3.11 so I am hopeful that will fix it but you can see here my error log where task task 2200 has been running for max duration 35 minutes so uh, these tasks are like just little tasks that like connect to a running copy of the game. That's for like the, you know, the two-way communication that I establish. And it's supposed to like shut those down after 35 or 30 minutes. Basically the, the server will tell the game like, hey, like start a new connection. 
And that way, you know, the game can restart a connection. If that server is like shutting down, that way the game will connect to a different one. So that's kind of how I keep the, the servers able to kind of refresh themselves. Um, but in those, these cases where it gets stuck after, you know, up at 35 minutes, then I just blow the whole thing away <laughs> if, it, if it hasn't shut down peacefully. But it seems like that, that's happening a lot where I'm having these connections that are not shutting down peacefully. So, so that's what I've been working on, just trying to get all that. I found uh, with this stuff, it's basically in, in order to be able to like, you know, run all these servers and keep sane and stuff, like I basically I need them to be, be behaving almost you know, like at 100%. <laughs> You know, like I, I, I feel like when you have like this many bad log messages coming through, like it's just that's not a healthy place to be because like I feel like the only way to stay sane is to have everything be working cleanly. And then when you do have a log message, you can like take a look at that and see like, oh, I need to fix this. But right now it's just like, uh, logs everywhere. Um, so yes, so yeah, I've been working on server stuff. So I don't have any super cool client updates this week. Um, Aside from, well, the switching the formatting. So if you take a look at, you know, if you, if you were to go to GitHub and take a look at diffs, you'll see like the hugest diff ever. So if we go to, let's just go to GitHub. Or if you take a look at commits, is what I meant to say. But yeah, which one was that? Um, oh yeah, this one. Like switching to black. So you can see exactly like what changed. It's kind of interesting. It's basically every single Python file. So this is like the, the biggest the biggest commit ever. Uh, but you can kind of see, like on the left is what Yapif did. Like in some cases, you know, it would squish stuff into the end of the line here, which is, you know, it's, it's all right. It looks a little ugly though. Um, you know, black over here, you know, it spreads it out a lot more, but I feel like it's a bit more kind of organized looking. Like Yap of Denner generally did a good job, but it was a bit more like fuzzy logic. And so sometimes it came up with just like weird stuff. Like that's a little weird. Um, so anyway, but yeah, there's this giant, <laughs> giant, giant commit. All right, so um, yeah, that's kind of like largely it on updates. Does anyone have any stuff they've been running into or questions or anything like that? I. Um, if not, I thought maybe I'd do like a live coding session or two, try to fix a bug or two that I told people I'd look into and I haven't had a chance yet. So I thought maybe I would do it live. <laughs> Bore you all to death. But first, anyone, uh, any topics or questions? Any, any thoughts on life, etc.? Hmm. Not seeing anything, so okay. Uh, yeah, so, um, yes, so I thought I would try some, some live coding. If, if any of you are like, aren't interested in like live coding, you know, you don't feel obligated to stick around or anything like that, or you can catch it on the video later. Um, I'll try to stick this on YouTube, but so there's two things, uh, that were, that I was going to try to look into. I don't know if I'll do one or both. Uh, but the first one was apparently the open URL command in, um, on the Android version of the game is like not working in all or some cases. Anyone here, I forgot who mentioned that. Um, is anyone here running into that or has run into that? Yeah, I thought it would be kind of cool just to show people how I work and stuff and, and, and all that. Um, again, hopefully it won't bore you all to death, but yeah, who was, who was running into that open URL issue? The, to clarify. That's the function, ba.openurl. Um, and it is supposed to, like, like here on the Mac version, let's just open Google. Okay, so yeah. So that's just supposed to be like a generic function that we can use anywhere to, um, you know, just redirect the user to a web browser. And now let's see what it's doing on Android. So I tested this briefly earlier and it did seem to be broken. So I will kind of show you guys what was happening. So I'm gonna bust out Android Studio. Now again, this part of the game, like the Android portion is not currently open sourced. Um, so this isn't unfortunately code that you can look through. That's something that I know this has been discussed and I'd like to maybe open source it 
it's really it's not a ton it's basically just like a thin java layer on top of like the the c plus plus guts of the game um it's just you know the the api is where you know the game will use to like oh hey android open a browser for me or like oh hey android uh do this so this is one of those things um and as i said i may may open source this part at some point the one concern was you know like don't want to i mean there's already a ton of kind of like modded copies of the game or, you know, nif maybe hopefully uh, for, for positive reasons, but, you know, a lot of like modified copies of the game floating around out there. And so I, you know, I'm a little bit worried about, you know, increasing that or, you know, I don't want to be people like passing viruses around and stuff like that or whatever, but it also would be uh, nice to allow people to tinker. So maybe there's some way that I can open source the Android portion in a, in a safe way. Um, okay, but anyway, so I looked into this earlier, and so here is, there's this function that gets called. Basically, when, when you call that open URL call, um, it winds up going down to the C++ layer. So the, if you kind of trace where it goes, like the Python call calls a, a function that is defined in C++, which makes it way down to this platform. So under the C++ layer, there's this platform object. And platform, this represents kind of all the platform specific stuff on the C++ layer. So this just defines a bunch of functions um, that can get called and then you know the, the platform kind of fills those out. And so an example here is like this clipboard stuff. So these are just virtual functions, or I guess these aren't virtual, but they call virtual functions. But you know these, these are functions that you can call from C++ to say like, oh, hey, do we have a clipboard on this platform? Like what text is on the clipboard? I'm gonna set the text. And so this is, if a platform then kind of fills these functions out, that means we have copy paste support on that platform, which is nice. I think most platforms have it at the moment. There's probably one or two missing still. Um, but anyway, there, one of these is open URL. Yeah, so this gets called basically. This platform colon colon open URL function gets called. And that on Android, uh, the, the Android version of this platform class, the Android override, then winds up passing it into the Java layer <laughs> on Android. And so it winds up here in this function called from native open URL. And so I should be able to, whoops. I was testing. I never actually use Android emulators, or traditionally I haven't. Like the, I've always just tested on real Android devices. I'll have to, when I get my, in the next week or two, I'll be able to use my phone as a webcam, and then I'll, I'll show you my, uh, my drawer full of janky old <laughs> Android test devices. But let's, um, the emulator seems to have been working, or be working pretty well these days, so I'm gonna give, give it a try. Everything should be set up here. Um, generic prod build, build variant now. Should be able to build and run the game and have it show up in the emulator. Fingers crossed. Things never work during demos, so I'm sure it will fail. Cradle build running. And there we go, okay, cool. Game is running. I will keep it sideways, even though that's super strange and awkward, uh, just because it fits better. And so now to test this, I was testing this earlier and I actually wound up using a Cloud Console. So I was like, oh, cool. My, my new little thing is useful. Because that's one kind of bummer is testing the Android version is like there wasn't a super easy way to run commands. I mean, you could like telnet in like with the telnet support, which is I think still in there, which maybe I should take that out at some point on a side note, uh, if Cloud Console works for everybody, because telnet is kind of, it's like it's such janky code. Plus like who has telnet installed anymore? That's like very insecure. Um, okay, anyway, go to devices, <laughs> see his wonderful name, Google SDK something something. Okay, so now I am 
should be connected to this phone to test that. Do screen message foo. Okay, cool, that's working. All right, so now we can, and if I'm correct, ba.openurl is broken here. So um, I think someone had said before, like it was working for some addresses and not others, but for me, it wasn't working for anything. I think it worked on older Android versions. Let's just throw in the whole address here. I don't remember if it requires the whole thing, but yeah, okay, broken. I mean, not broken, but it, like this is the fallback. Like when the game, when the game doesn't think that it has a browser available, it just shows you this window and says like, "Hey, go here," <laughs> which is it's not you know this is not the intended or desirable behavior. Turn that down a bit. Oh, fighting with my screen here. Okay, so so here we are. So we have a, a repro case. We are able to run this code and get something happening wrong. And, um, and so now looking at the code here, hopefully you can you can all see this. It seems to break only for HTTPS stuff. Oh really? Well, if I try, let's try. I thought it broke for both for me. Yeah. See, even on this test case, it's breaking for uh, both. I ran like a, I tested on like an earlier Android emulator and it worked there. So it seems that whatever method I'm using here is <laughs> is definitely flaky. And looking at it, it does look flaky. Like I'm not really sure. Like this is the code basically. So just to make sure that this code is working from native open URL. So I'm gonna just throw a log in here. Like log, this is Android logging. I have a tag, which is ballistica core. Hello world from URL open. Okay, now um, rebuild and rerun the game. Oh, a copy URL button. Oh yeah, that's, yeah, on that, on that fallback page, that would be super useful, a copy, yeah. Um, yes, we should definitely do that. I know there's been, like, people have added copy buttons in a few other places recently, so that would be a great place to add a copy button. The copy functionality is kind of new, that popped up, like, six months ago or something. So we haven't, it hasn't been added in every place that it could be useful. Oh, uh, let's see. Okay, so if we go to the run section here, on the side note, so this this run section, I, I assume it's the same as the logcat section. I, I feel like I don't spend enough time in Android Studio to know it inside and out, but basically this is the Android log. And so this used to be uh, kind of the only way that you could look at the game output like you'd had to you know, install the Android SDK and look at the Android log and then you could kind of see what was happening. Uh, so that's part of the reason that I put together this cloud console so that you don't need this anymore. Um, but it's still useful in some cases, like, like this is just an Android log call, so it's only gonna show up in the Android log. Um, we would have to, like, the cloud console shows all of like Python's output, um, but it doesn't show you know, like low level stuff like the Android log or if you're writing, uh, you know, if you're hacking around in C++ and you write like a printf function or a cout function in C++, like that won't show up here either. Like this is only like Android or Python level stuff. So kind of like Python's logging, Python's printing, kind of like higher level stuff, which you should, there's really not a huge reason to use low level stuff. Um, and you know, the big downside is it won't show up in places like this or like in the, the in-game console on platforms where you have access to that. So the, the higher level stuff like Android print functions or Android, or <laughs> I keep saying Android when I mean Python, like Python print or Python log, those will all show up. You know, we can intercept those pretty easily and redirect them to nice places like the cloud console. Um, but anyway, so what, <laughs> long story long. So if we run this again, we should see, okay, that happens again and we should see, yeah, hello world. You can see this went to the Android log. So. We are getting, this is 10 internal, what is that 10 internal lines? Oh yeah, it's suppressing meaningless stuff. Okay, so we're at the point where, um, yeah, we have this function and this function needs to basically tell Android to open a URL and it's currently not doing that. 
Um, so if you, if you can see this code, basically, so we have this kit back to game, which is false. And so it has this stuff it tries here where it's like it, it attempts to have Android display this URL. And if any of those work, oh, I guess by default, it won't kick back to the game, but it tries, it tries these things. And if those don't work, then it does kick back to the game. So it sets this to true if any of those fail. I guess I could have done it the opposite way where it starts at true and then sets it at false, but anyway. And then at the end here, if kick back to game is true at this point, then it, it sends a little message uh, back to the C++ layer saying like, hey, display this URL. And that message is what gets us uh, this lovely like in-game display thing. So basically saying like, hey, I couldn't display this natively in Android, so hey game, why don't you show this window. Um, so basically looking at this code, this code looks completely, I feel like out of date and broken. <laughs> so we probably need to, like I probably wrote this back in like Android four days. So I'm sure there, there's probably like a proper correct way to tell Android to open a URL in a browser. It's probably like a one line call. I'm trying to see what it was even doing here. Something about, okay, so first off, there's a special case for Fire TV, which probably doesn't need to be there anymore. Like Fire TV was Amazon's like TV based or Android based TV box that they launched in like 2013 or 2014. And it used to be like very kind of custom because that was before like Android TV or, you know, Android didn't like officially support TV devices. Uh, so I, I still have like a decent amount of code where it like does special stuff just for Fire TV, but I probably need to rip that out. It probably can just use standard, whatever the standard Android function is. Like, you know, hey, do you have a web browser? Are you running on a TV? You know, there's probably probably better ways to ask that. But then I'm trying to see what this is doing here. So, browser intent, your browser intent resolve. Well, I guess maybe this code is still valid. So something like action intent action view. This is somewhere with Android, you can basically just say like, hey, I'm, I want, yeah, it's basically just saying like, I want a way to view this URL. Browser intent. But this, this is the code that I'm wondering about. So, okay, so we, we ask Android for some sort of info. I'm actually curious, let's see if info is not null, because there's this weird thing here, it looks like some some weird behavior where if info is not null, and yeah, this line looks really ugly. Something about google.android.tv. Blah blah blah. So basically, if we get back info and the package name doesn't start with, oh okay, I I guess I see what this is doing. So basically, yeah, if we have info and it doesn't look like we're on running on a TV, then we start to do this browser intent thing. Okay. Otherwise, we kick back to the game. So apparently this is not working. Let's, I'm gonna see if this is actually running. So I'm gonna throw a little debug print in here. You know, I, <laughs> this would be a, an interesting topic, like how many people actually like use debuggers and like step through lines of code and, and stop. Like I tend to be more of like a print debug person, at least for, for starting with, you know, if I have to, I will actually use a debugger and like break points and things. But when I can get away with prints, I usually just use prints. So let's use a print here. Um, so let's just add another log statement. Log.b tag. We are going to start activity. What is it complaining about shortcuts? Um, eh, go away, I'll figure this out later. Okay, we're going to start activity. Um, and for the else, let's print will kick back to game. All right. Now recompile, rebuild. Okay, running again. Um, console reconnected. Okay, now let's see what it says. Hello world from open from URL open will kick back to game. Okay. 
So it never even got to this part. It never, never got to the start activity part. Um, so I'm assuming that means that info is probably null. So just to confirm that, because I, I assume this statement is not true. So let's just do uh, log.b tag info is info. Or, Oh wait, wait, wait. <laughs> I'm uh, don't spend a ton of time in Java, so excuse my uh, slowness here. Ah, I think we can just print it like this. Info is null. You know what? I'm just gonna. Espanol. I took uh, four years of Spanish in high school, and I can say like very little, like "Donde está el baño" and things like that. Oh, uh, burp, burp, burp. oh, wait, what? Extra. Oh no. <laughs> so I just made this emulator earlier this morning, and oh my gosh, how did we even? It started like complaining. Okay, can I uninstall? What? I am so like not used to like new Androids. Uh, like, where's the app launcher? One moment. Yeah, can anyone help me here? Like, swipe from, oh, from like, ah, yes, okay, I, knew, I should know that. Can I uninstall any of the default stuff here? Or maybe I can just, like by default, it, it was making this emulator with like not enough space to install like a single app, which seems like a slight oversight. Like maybe I would want to install my app on this emulator to test it. Okay, let's see if we can do it now. Okay, there we go. Yeah, I do have gestures turned on. I actually, I do want to like learn, uh, I do want to like learn Android gestures. I mean, I'm, I have, I'm an iPhone guy myself most of the time. I mean, I, aside from, you know, deving on devices constantly, but um, so I'm used to gestures. It's just like, I, I'm not super familiar with like Android's version of them. So, but I need to learn. There was something, uh, I got some warning from, um, Google is saying like, I need to update something with the game before I can target like API 33, like the latest Android, because like the, the game intercepts like back presses, but those like don't exist in the same form now or something. So I need to make sure that the game will still behave itself um, in like a gesture based world. Uh, okay, where was I? Oh, I have to sign back in again. One second. Signing in as me. There we go. I'm waiting for with, with these QR code based sign ins. I, I, one of these days, someone else is going to like sign in as themselves on this stream before I'm able to. I'm sure it's going to happen. Uh, okay, anyway, I'm signed in. Client contact lost. Okay, probably make sure we're working. Yes, okay.
Okay, run the test again. Okay, so info is null. So we just ran the test again and it says info is null. So that means this line, whatever, whatever I'm doing to get this URL uh, activity. Okay, <laughs> and now it's time for our dear friend uh, Google or Stack Overflow or whatever, like how to open a URL on Android. Well, shoot, uh, I guess Android API open URL. From 2011? No. Um, Puma? Anyone know this offhand? Open Chrome dot simple? What? I just mean like, what is, there, there must be some Android API call to just say like, hey, Android, Show me a web browser with this address. Um, yeah, like this. Now this actually looks like what I'm doing. So string URL, blah, blah, blah. Curious if this info is out of date. Because I believe that's what I'm doing. So it's just. Interesting. Okay, so yeah, that does does look like I'm doing the same thing, I think. So I'm wondering why I'm getting null for info. Custom Chrome tabs? Well, in this case, I... Is this one of those things where it like opens a a web view like as part of your app like I'm I kind of <laughs> like I know like like Twitter and different apps you know it like brings up at least on on iOS it, it brings up like a web view which is like part of the app and I always find that annoying like I'd rather it just kick me over to like Safari or Chrome or whatever um, is custom Chrome tabs like that same thing where it or is is that kind of a, a good just generic way to like, will that just open it in your default browser or whatever? Oh no, it's a <laughs> dang it, Medium. I'm always getting like cool Medium stories that seem like that'd be fun to read, but I don't have a Medium account, so maybe I should get one. Because yeah, in general, like I don't really want to be, I don't need to be in control of this browser or anything like that. I don't need to do anything custom with it. I just need to basically say like, hey, go, go to Chrome and look at this.
Okay, so I may have to dig into why this, this isn't working. So I have this intent. So it does seem like that the game is maybe doing the right thing or doing something that should work, unless this changed. Maybe there's like a new permission that, that it requires or something like that. Oh, this could be something. If this wants to work. Uh oh. Did I lose internet? Arg. My computer's been getting into this funny state lately where like, I basically lose the ability to <laughs> browse the web. I'm wondering if that happened. I may have to like put this on pause for a moment and reboot. Um, the URL from intent. So, hello? Someone say something? Uh, well, this looks slightly different. So, what's the use of browser intent and then tutorials to not have browser intent? Okay, so yeah, this looks a little bit different. So maybe, yeah, let's give this a try. So maybe it'll just uh, comment all this out, try this code. Oh heck, let's just stick with google.com. Intent, action view, for start activity. Um, So that will compile. So now, um, okay, we'll try these four lines, see what happens. Hey, it works. Woohoo, okay. So yeah, something with, yeah, again, I don't know too much about like the intent system or anything like that, but it's seeming like this code is working. 
so the one thing here is let's let's replace it with instead of using uh, hard coding it to Google, let's use our URL. So which should just be that. So kill that. Do that. And I'm wondering if maybe the reason I did the intent stuff is just so that it could determine. I think it was trying to determine if the system would ha be able to handle it. Because for like on Android TV, I do want it on certain, some cases I want it to return that, uh, you know, to, because on TV there's no browsers or, you know, on some like variations of Android, there's no browser available. So in that case, you know, I wanted to try to detect that case and then kick it back to the game. So I wonder if that's still possible here. Like if start activity will fail in that case or, you know, what, what will happen. Um, but first, let's just make sure this is working. Oh yeah, we yeah, a QR code would be good. I feel like that that fallback window, yeah, it could have like a copy like a copy button and a QR code. Like I feel like either of those would be handy. Um, my question was just like when do we uh, like when do we know that we need to show that? Because like, you know, if if we do this, well, first let's make sure this works which it should. Okay, so um, let's change this to yahoo.com. And yeah, okay, cool. Hooray. Uh, yeah, so we've, yeah, we've fixed this. But yeah, that leaves the, that's kind of the one open question is, yeah, how do we determine if this fails or if we're running on, you know, Android TV or something where it's probably not gonna work or, like, how do we know when to set kickback to game to be true in this case? So I guess that's, I'll have to look into that a little bit, but it's good to know that, that these three lines seem to do the right thing, whereas <laughs> this, this bit was not. So I'm curious why. Okay, but I think uh, it looks like I can probably make a Android emulator for Android TV and then just figure out, you know, try something on there and try to figure out like what it'll do in that case. I mean, uh, it should, like on Android TV, it, like, it's not actually, it's, you know, th this function doesn't actually send anything over the internet. It's just, it's kicking you over to a browser. But like, if there is no browser, like if you're on Android TV, I'm sure it just fails silently or something like that. Um, you know, I, I don't think there's a way to like kick you to a browser on a TV device or, you know, on like a micro console. Um, so it's just being able to like do something reasonable in that case. Because in that case, we do want the game to just like show its, I mean, we want to improve that window and make it you know, like, add a QR code and a copy button, but we do, we would like the game to do something reasonable then, you know, just say like, hey, go, go to this address. Um, so yeah, so we need to, so I'll, I maybe won't do that part now because that part seems like it might take a little digging where <laughs> um, I, I probably need to make a, a new emulator, a TV emulator and just poke around and see what happens like when I try to run this code, like what it does. Um, but hey, we've, we've, in general, it looks like we've fixed things. It just needs a little bit of cleanup. So I will add this to uh, the next update, so 1.7.11. So what is this new pipe? Oh, cool, cool, cool. Okay, yeah, so maybe something like this. Yeah, like, no, whatever it's doing here. If default package name. Okay, so yeah, I, I can take a look at that. So yeah, thanks for the, thanks for that link. Nifty. All right, so I'll shut that down for now.
So yay, fun, <laughs> successful live coding. Cool. Any, uh, any questions or comments on that? I thought maybe there was one other thing I thought I'd maybe do is uh, dive in terms of live coding is maybe dive into uh, some bomb squad UI and add, I'd mentioned this before and, you know, it gotten talked about before is adding like a settings option to plugins. So I thought maybe, maybe I'd attempt to do that if people would be interested in that, or is there anything else people would like to see in terms of just like a quick little live coding demo or things like that? Take a sip of coffee. Cool, yeah, I'm happy to hear that. I kind of figured they would be. I, I know I like seeing that if I'm, you know, watching someone who maintains a project. Just curious, like, like what tricks that they have that they're, you know, that I don't know about or things like that. So hopefully this kind of helps in that regard. Though I feel like uh, doing like that Android level Java stuff, like that's, I feel like I'm, I'm super awkward in that layer. So I feel like I don't have cool you know, mad skills or tricks and stuff like that. It's a little bit kind of just keeping it working. Hopefully I'll have better ones on like Python layer stuff. I also need to learn, uh, how do you say Kotlin, Kotlin, the, whatever the, that language that they're kind of like replacing Java with on the Android side. I'd, at some point I'd like to, you know, convert stuff over to that. It seems like they're, they're pushing hard on that Kotlin. Yeah. It's one of those words where I've read like a million times. And so like I say it in my head, but I've never actually, I don't think I've actually heard another human being say it. So I'm probably saying it totally wrong. All right. Well, if no one has, I'll wait another moment. If anyone has any, uh, you know, things you'd like to see or whatever, coding demos. Otherwise, I think I will dive in and try the um, the plugin uh, settings button, which hopefully won't take too long. The challenge there will be uh, fighting against Bomb Squad's UI API, which is so terrible. I know I've mentioned this many times before, but yeah. I, I do want to write a cleaner UI API at some point, but the one that's in there, it's like it's used in so many places and it, it gets the job done. So it's just like it, it lives on. Uh, building a debug iOS version of Bomb Squad. Oh yeah, I do. Um, I have, <laughs> it's, uh, it is right here on my phone actually. Um, so there, debug iOS version. Uh, but yeah, I, I keep iOS builds going. Um, it like the iOS version still needs polish and things like that. Like it, there's there's like a, a decently sized list of stuff I need to fix up and finish. But it's like I do keep it building, so I have it on my iPad and my iPhone and everything like that, just to to make sure I don't break it in terrible ways. I know, yeah, I I, I shouldn't have shown that. I'm gonna have to blur that out on this. If I record this, save this video, I'll have to blur that out on iOS and like beep what I was saying, you know, for, for my own safety. Uh, though it couldn't be worse. I know I've mentioned this before. There's, a, there's that video on YouTube of me showing the iOS like test builds from like 2011 or something like that. And it just keeps getting more, more comments, people getting like angrier over time. Like, why is it still not on iOS? But yeah, 2.0, working towards it as fast as I can, then, then iOS, I promise. Uh, Bomb Squad characters. Yes, I do want to make more characters. That's, that's definitely a common question. Um, after 1.8, 1 1.8 is all about getting, uh, <clears throat> getting it easier to add new assets to the game and like asset packages, being able to like add new maps, new characters, whatever, without forcing everyone else to download a game update and trying to keep that in sync so that people with the old game don't try to connect to a map that's only available in the new game and stuff like that. So uh, 
with asset packages, it should just be like, if there's a new map, like everyone who joins the game will download that map, stuff like that. So I, I do want to add more characters and other things, uh, but 1.8 is, I, I really want to get that done first. And, and then it'll just be a lot less painful to do such things. Because yeah, I, I don't know, I do have a bunch of like character ideas I'd, I'd still like to make and things like that. And it's been too long since I've like made stuff. I feel bad. I've been doing nothing but coding for years. On that note, how about some live coding? Um, okay, so. All right, so today's, uh, the assignment is to make something resembling a uh, settings button. Um, now, if you've been doing any kind of mod development, you'll know that under settings advanced, we now, these days we have like the plugins section. So when you write plugins for the game, they show up here and you can turn them off and on, basically. There's a checkbox, but nothing else. Actually, let me, I should have a workspace I can enable just to get these showing up. So if I come back to workspaces, yeah, oh, whoops. So I have a workspace here, which should have, yeah, just an example plugin in it. Um, actually, let me, I'll go ahead and make a second one. So I'll just add a, my plugin too. And let's go ahead and add a third one, just to my plugin three. Okay, so now I have a workspace with three plugins. And turn syncing on for this workspace. So now if I'm signed in as me, I should get that workspace. So I'll relaunch the game. And is it not working? Oh no, do I have a, or maybe it did. No, it didn't, oh no. This might be a total fail. Can't sync. Oh, is this, is my internet still behaving wonky? No, because I'm accessing it here. Can't sync workspace. Oh, geez. Okay, so apparently I have to uh, fix something. Can't sync workspace. Oh, geez. Well. Let me run a command line version of it. See if it gives me more, more info. Sign in as me again. Okay, so it sees my workspace. Oh no. Hmm. Well, that is definitely something I'll be looking into. Like, probably not in a live coding thing because I don't want to bore you, but. So it looks like it found the previous version of my workspace. So, okay, so I do have one plug in here. All right, so you can see this is like the normal plugin list. Like you, there's a list of plugins, you can turn them off and on. And the goal is we wanna add like a little edit or settings button here so that if plugins want, they can define, they can define settings. So, For that, uh, we're gonna go into, so if you grab the game, the asset, it's under assets, build, not build, assets source, BA data, um, Python, the standard library, UI, I think settings, <laughs> that's a ways down here. Um, plugins, okay. This should be it. So plug it, plug in settings window. Yes, so it's not terribly huge, but this should be what we want. Oh, what about setting a custom physical directory for plugins? Uh, I guess there's nothing, no reason we couldn't do that. I'm trying to think if that ex already exists in like an environment variable or something like that. I think you can, um, 
I think you can set the overall config directory for the game. I think there's an argument there, like where you can tell it, like, hey, read all your stuff from this directory, and so then it'll look like for a mods directory under that. Um, we could certainly make make the plugins, or yeah, configure. Um, I mean, we could split out like a custom physical directory for plugins if if that would be useful. So happy happy to accept a PR, like either an environment variable or just an extra like command line argument or something. Um, okay, so anyway, here is our plugin settings window. And you know, as with always, like might have problems on Android. Oh yeah, Android, I mean that again, largely the um, cloud console is for, for Android, you know, since it's kind of tricky to you know, some people can install stuff directly in specific places, but and you know, it's generally Android's more locked down, so that's why I was trying to make cloud-based stuff accessible uh, for that purpose. But but yeah, if you're running on Linux or Mac or Windows or whatever, yeah, you might want to stick plugins in some specific place. And you can also, I mean, there's, um, I mean, most of this is just standard Python stuff, so it you know it picks up stuff from Python standard directories. So I. I, have, I forgot if this works on all platforms, but you might be able to just like override Python path, at least like on Linux. Uh, so depending on the platform, yeah, you might already be able to just like throw some plugins in this specific path and modify your Python path before you um, before you launch the game. That could be an option. So howdy, that is QQ. Uh, okay, anyway, so uh, here we go on this. So the first thing I always do, as as we saw before, is just hello world. So let's, you know, let's come to this plugin settings window and, oh, no, I guess that's that's a decent size, plugin settings window, and we'll just do a print hello world, standard stuff, just to make sure my code is running. And I'll just do do a make c make down here, which will. the game. I guess I'll just deal with that annoying error message. Um, plugins. Okay, so the plugins window came up and you can see down here, hello world. So, so far so good. Trying to fit everything into a smallish screen space here. Ah. I have like two monitors, so like this, this zoom function the OS provides, it behaves like really wonky with two monitors, so that's why I have to keep like adjusting it. I should probably just turn my second monitor off when I'm doing these presentations. Okay, so let's see what this is doing. All right, scale, so I provided an origin, scale up from that, blah, blah, blah. So it's setting some different sizes. Um, so the Blistica UI stuff, there's basically three, three distinct scales. There's like phone scale, tablet scale, and like desktop scale, and that basically influences like how big stuff is. So in most, in a lot of cases, I kind of set things specifically for all three scales, just to kind of. And if you're writing UIs, it's a good idea to kind of test all all three of those scales. Um, if you look through the code, there's there's environment variables and there's ways you can kind of force it to run the game at a certain scale. So you can like see like, oh, what, the, what would this look like on phone size? Uh, that's a random side note. Okay, so yeah, it sets all this stuff based on the scale and then it creates this container widget, which is basically that window. Um, yeah, okay, and then it calculates like the size of the scroll bars, scroll width, scroll height. Which is based on like the window width with some some math. And we create a back button. Uh, create a cancel button. Oh yeah, yeah. We create a back button and then we assign that. Someone was asking this the other day, like how to assign like key shortcuts to uh, like different buttons. This is like one way you can do it. Where basically you say you're telling the container widget to uh, use the back button as its cancel button. So this is kind of a you know an ugly way to do that, but um, this is how the in general all these UI functions they have this really janky method of working where you call call like ba button widget to create a button, 
But then if you want to edit that button later, like edit an attribute on it, you call ba.button widget again and you pass like edit equals my button. And then you can, you know, instead of creating a button, you're like editing an existing button. Um, so this was, this was one of like the first UI or first bits of the API I wrote for like Bomb Squad back in the day. So the, the UI stuff just behaves in that kind of ugly fashion. I actually did that because I was working with Maya, like the 3D app Maya, and a lot of its old school functions work that way, where like there's one function call that either creates something or edits it. And so I was just like used to that. And so I just set up the, the API to work that way. Um, if we redo this, like we should make proper, like just classes for all these things. So, you know, it'd be a lot more standard Python where it's just like create text widget and then like widget dot position equals X, whatever. Um, anyway, side, <laughs> side note. So what we're doing, okay, creating a back button, creating a scroll widget. So the scroll widget is just a widget that contains other stuff in a scrollable area. Okay, sub container equals column widget. A column widget takes all of its children and just like lines them up, you know, one above the other, I believe. Uh, okay, and here it goes through the list of plugins, checks some stuff to see if it's okay. See if plugin is enabled. Okay, and so it looks like for each of these, all it's doing is creating a checkbox widget. Okay, so this might just be the checkbox widget. Yes, okay, so yeah, I guess checkbox widgets have text associated with them. That's probably true, because yeah, if you can, you can see that's actually part of the, the checkbox, because if you click on the text, it enables and disables it. All right. So so, so basically what we have here is a column widget with you know, checkbox widgets directly underneath it. So if we wanted to add a button over here, then we probably, hello, <laughs> we probably need to replace these checkbox widgets with something else, like, like a row widget. So it's interesting, like, again, the, the kind of janky bomb squad UI stuff, I do have like column and row widgets and things where you can kind of use to lay out stuff, but uh, they're not especially well behaved in all cases. They kind of like, they work in some limited cases, but they don't have a ton of like alignment options and things like that. So if we wanted, you know, a button to be like aligned to the end here, like I don't think the column widget would work for that. Um, So in cases like this, like a lot of times what I do is it's super janky, but I just, I create like a, uh, I basically create a single like container widget under here and then I position stuff on it manually. So it's, you know, just that way you have like total control over it. Um, it's just a bit ugly of code. So I'm wondering if that might be the best thing to do here. Hmm. So like the public party window? Oh, is that in response to what I was just saying? Probably, I think like all the fancy windows, they, they do that trick where it's just like, it creates a, a container widget and then just manually positions things on it because that gives you, you know, it, it's ugly, but it gives you like the most control. You can just put stuff exactly where you want it. So that might be the best thing to do here. Um, so I'm wondering, actually first thing, I'm wondering if I can give this some fake dummy data. Like, so another thing when working with stuff like this, a lot of times it's best to just, you know, have a bunch of like dummy data, like 10 different rows so you can kind of see. And also the fact that my, uh, my workspace is not behaving itself right now. So dummy data would be good, but okay. What is a plug state? Oh, it's just a dict. Okay. Let's just print it. Plug state is. Um, I'm going to plug this. Trying, okay. So that, yeah, I'm trying to refamiliarize myself with, <laughs> with this stuff. 
there's something like the game keeps a list of potential plugins and then it also keeps a list of actual plugins that are running so there's like kind of two different lists in a way um, let's just print plug list Throw a print in there, restart the game. Oops. If I'm going to be working in something a lot, I generally like to create a shortcut. To, like I'll hack the main menu where it just immediately goes here or something like that, but it doesn't take too long to get here. Okay, so plug list, we just have, okay, so a potential plugin. So a plug list is just full of potential plugins. And then, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace this with my own. Um, I could probably just give it a string name. Let's see if I can give it a dummy value for that. Dummy path. Available equals true. Again, formatting on that. Okay, what is wrong? Potential plugin. Uh, okay. Where is potential plugin? Okay. I'll just throw an import here for when I'm hacking around with stuff, I don't care about like <laughs> placing imports in the right place. Um, so I found potential plugin under, uh, if you can see here, Python BA underscore plugin. Actually, that might be, that might be at the top level. Is that a thing? BA potential? Oh yeah, okay, sorry, whoops. I sometimes forget like which classes I've exposed as like BA dot whatever. Um, oh, expected L string. Okay, fine. Um, L string value equals dummy plug. So an L string, if you're not familiar, an L string is a uh, localization string. And this is just a, instead of using like hard coding a string, this basically just tells you like use this resource string or you know, use this translated string. It's just a way to provide strings that uh, that can be translated later or that work with multiple languages or whatever. Okay, so now I've replaced plug list with my own hard-coded one here. So now I'm going to restart the game and hopefully, uh, I guess, did I kill the game already? Okay. Hopefully we'll see this dummy list show up instead of the real one. Advanced plugins. Okay, there we go. So dummy plug. So I'm just feeding this dummy data in. Um, so now I can go in here and throw a few of these in here. So now I have a list of three potential plugins. Dummy plug two, dummy plug three. Rerun the game. Advanced. Um, okay, so you can see this is what it looks like with three plugins in here. Um, and it, it can be good for like when you have this dummy data to like test it with 10 or 20 things just to make like sure the scrolling works and stuff like that. But for now, we'll, we'll stick with three. And so, okay, so I need to think for a moment about how to, to go about this. So there's this scroll widget, and what we want to do, so we create the scroll, the, the scroll widget, and then we create a column widget underneath it. Um, so probably what I'll want to do is take out the column widget and replace it with a container widget. Um, so for that, so this subcontainer, 
So let's first off, let's just try to get that working. So I will create a container widget under this column widget. So well, first, let me see where I define subcontainer. Did I define subcontainer? Oh, I guess I'm in init right now. I'm doing a lot of work in the init function. So okay. So subcontainer is whatever I'm setting it to here. So do self dot subcontainer equals ba dot uh, what's it called container widget. Now I'm going to look for other examples of container widget. I guess this will come up with a bunch of stuff. Container widget is really dumb because it's it's what you use for Windows, but it's also you can use it to like contain other stuff. So it's kind of like two, it's serving two completely separate purposes, uh, which is kind of dumb. I I want to split that out at some point so there would be like a like a window widget and then also a container widget. Uh, okay, well let me just try like width equals. Or is it size? <laughs> I haven't been doing, uh, I forget like what, what args are available. Let me see if this will, okay, size equals, oh, cannot parse, ah. All right, something is not parsable here. Oh, whoops, there we go. Oh yeah, duh. Okay. All right, so that code compiles via container widget, and then um, I'm gonna come in here and just turn this off for now, I think. So I use this kind of code to just disable stuff temporarily a lot of times, I indent that. So the, this place where it goes through and actually adds all the, the plugins to that container, I'm just turning that off right now. So what I want to get going is I, I just want to have this container widget show up under that scroll section, and then I'll, I'll go from there. So come back here, build the game. Okay, so there's our container widget. Oh, but we didn't set a parent. Oh, of course. So we basically, we just created a new window on top of everything. Um, so we do container widget parent equals self scroll widget size equals 100, 100. All right, now we should see that little, actually, oh yeah, okay. Yeah, so there's our container widget. We've just created a you can see you can actually scroll it. Um, this little scrollable container thing here underneath this scroll widget. So obviously that's a little bit small. Though actually it doesn't clip anything. Like you can actually create stuff on top of your container that would just like leak out over the sides. Um, and what normally you do when, when you're using a container widget as part of a UI, uh, there's like a background equals false. I believe that's it. Yeah, background equals false. And so now we should see like nothing in there. Okay, so yeah, so we have a widget in there, but it's not showing up. Okay, so usually I, I actually leave this turned on until like while I'm debugging stuff just so then you can see the ugly little background. So I'm going to start messing with the sizes here. So I'll do size equals, uh, how big was that scroll widget? I have values when I created the scroll widget up here. Oh yeah, scroll width. So let's do, scroll width and just set 400 for now. So scroll width, width, 400 height. See what this looks like. Settings advanced, work, 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 plugins. Okay. There, you can see, you know, pretty ugly looking, but you can see like the little sub widget that is nested in, in this widget. And it looks like for, I almost made it exactly the right height. It's a little bit scrollable here. 
But then, uh, so what you want to do in this case is, it's a bit, as I said, annoying, but you kind of, you'd have to figure out how many plugins you have and then create the, the, the container at that size. Like you, so the, the downside of doing things this way is you kind of have to like pre-size like the container sizes you need. Whereas if you use uh, stuff like column widgets and row widgets, then they just, they kind of grow as needed. But we're doing it the manual way because that gives us most control. So we got to figure this stuff out. So let's, I'm going to put this code that where we create the container, I'm going to put it down below our dummy data. I guess I could have moved our dummy data up, but so what we're going to do is, so we have this plug list. So this is our list of plugins we want to display. Um, so we're just going to come up with some value like plug line height equals 50. <laughs> just make that up. And so the, for the size of our subcontainer, we want to basically allocate enough height for any plugin we have to show. So let's just do uh, length of plug list times plug line height. Run auto formatting. And so now we should have, you know, just to make sure that's working, uh, we should have about 150 pixels or 150 points, wh whatever the heck these units are. Yeah, so that's you know 150 units. This is enough to show like three three plugins. Again, we will hide this background once we're done with it because right now it's kind of handy just to see how how big your subcontainer is. And okay, now we're probably ready to go back under this code again. So I'm going to unindent this. Um, Kill this, and now let's see, as we go through the plug list, it's doing some magic here just to come up with like what it should be showing. But the important part is here, it's creating a checkbox widget. And so, normally, so before that it would create a checkbox widget and add it as to the subcontainer. And because that subcontainer was a column widget, um, you know, it would just pop it at the bottom. And so this is still actually going to do the right thing. It's still going to add it to our subcontainer, but our subcontainer no longer like lays out its children automatically. So we have to set some sort of uh, you know explicit position for it. I don't think. Yeah, it doesn't look like there's one here. So we'll do uh, position equals. And okay, we're using enumerate, which is the fancy Python thing where you can you know, increment some value as you're going through something. So I will be like zero, one, two, three, as it goes through the, the plugins. So we want to do like I times plug line height, um, and then zero, because we want it at the beginning. So now let's see what this does. Okay, so this is gonna go through and create checkbox widgets for each of those. I don't know if we need these parts. I'm gonna comment this part out for now. There's, let's see, edit equals. So there's this stuff called like show buffer where it, it affects like how scrolling works. So like when you scroll to this thing, it will kind of add a buffer area around it so that you know it's kind of centered a little bit. But I'm just gonna turn that off for now because that might make things behave weird while we're kind of taking them apart. And let me disable that because I don't need it right now. And okay, and this just selects the scroll widget. So okay, that looks like it will hopefully do something reasonable. Okay, settings, advanced, plugins. Oh, geez. Okay, oh, did I? <laughs> Oops, I mixed up X and Y, and this is what happens. So. Yeah, you can see we, we incremented uh, where we're drawing these things. It's just, you know, instead of incrementing this way, we incremented this way. That's not good. So we need to, let's, my linter complains if I have unused variables and if you just throw an underscore under something, it stops complaining. That's a, a random tip. 
Okay, so for position, we want uh, zero. And then i times plug line height. Check this again. And now, uh, okay, here we go. So that's starting to look like something reasonable. Uh, the one issue you'll see is we have dummy plug, dummy plug two, dummy plug three. They're kind of out of order because we defined these you know, the first one is dummy plug, and then we just dummy plug two, dummy plug three. We want them to show that order. Um, so the problem is Bomb Squad's UI is bottom left is zero, zero. So if you, which is kind of dumb, I think, I feel like most UI systems top left is zero, zero, because naturally, you know, you usually start drawing things from the top left and kind of spill downward, but <laughs> not for us. <laughs> so I forgot why I did that originally. I don't know if I had a reason, but that was, that would have been like 15 years ago. So I have no idea. But we have to account for it. So, uh, so what we have to do is use a little bit of math. We can't. Yeah, probably. I mean, I guess there, there's probably some. I guess for game purposes, like you'd maybe think of zero being like the ground, and this is like the sky, <laughs> or something. Uh, but anyway, the it is what it is. So we have to just do a little math here to keep these things starting at the top. So um, that's pretty easy. We have, we calculated the height. Oh yeah, so we should um, we should make a variable for that. So when we made this container widget, let's just call it like sub height equals. We want to calculate like how big this container widget's height is. We might be able to like access that by like calling. Actually, I don't know if there's a way to query a container height. So we'll just store the value. Um, so it was this length of plug list times plug line height. So we're going to set that as sub height and then plug in sub height when we create the container. And now when we are setting position, instead of I times plug line height, we can do the, the total height of this thing, which is sub height minus I times plug line height. Okay. <laughs> Save that, make sure it compiles, or not compiles, but make sure type checking works. Run it again. Settings advanced. Okay, so almost working. The only problem is here you can see the, the zero-based system is biting us again, sort of. So we have to, we didn't account for uh, the height of, of these individual things. So what we actually want is zero sub height minus, we can just do i plus one, or we could add an offset in there. Okay, so here we go. And so yeah, now we have our three plugins displaying in the correct order. And then now the question becomes like the thing we wanted to add. So we're finally almost ready to add add the little uh, checkbox, or not checkbox, we wanna add like a button at the end. So basically we can just do that right here. We'll just do uh, ba.buttonWidget parent equals self dot sub container uh, text equals for now I'm just going to do test button uh, none of this other stuff matters do I'll just throw in like a random size to I'll just do 130 just a guess and I'm trying to think what else this is kind of coming from memory what else button widgets need Probably would do it for now. Uh, we won't add the action or anything yet until we get the button where we want it. Uh, position, of course, is the important part. And so for position, so each time through this loop, you know, we're going to create this checkbox for a particular plugin, and then we're going to create this button for a particular plugin. So we want to basically use the same position, except instead of zero, we're going to want to put it at the end of this container. So. To keep clean here, let's let's make another variable for the container width. So do sub width, and we're actually just setting this to be scroll width. So we could just use scroll width, but this kind of keeps it clean. So when we create this con sub container, we're now using sub width, sub height, sub height, sub height, and we can use that down here. So we'll do position equals sub width minus 120. So the width of our button minus a little bit of extra. 
and then the height is uh, this same value. So, so I'm not copying and pasting. Um, let's just do item height equals or item uh, not height item y. Pull that out. Item y equals calculate that position equals that and then same thing here item y close that okay now save the file let type checking run okay type checking found an error so this is why type checking is handy because it tells me that my code would fail <laughs> so we come over here and we see that unexpected keyword argument text for button widget and that's right it's it's label i think okay cool type checking went through um and and about type checking, you can, um, I have it, I spent a bunch of time <laughs> getting up, set up so it runs automatically in Emacs when I save stuff. Uh, you can, different editors, you can integrate that in different ways. You can also just come in here and just do make mypy on the command line and it'll run that same type checking for you. So, you know, it's a, it's a good thing to do just right before you run the game because it'll tell you if something's gonna break without having to like go through and have it break. All right, so anyway, that's working. So go back to launch the game. Plugins, haha, -ha. okay, so there we go. So we have, uh, so now it's very ugly, but you can see it's at least working. So we have our plugin, plugin checkbox, and then right next to it is a button. You know, obviously we should do some adjustments uh, to kind of move these buttons up so they, they line up better. And um, let's see, one other thing I should mention is, actually, I'll, I'll go back there. So when I originally wrote the UI system, it was, you know, soup, I don't know, I was, I was having it uh, like auto-select things based on like tab and stuff. Oh yeah, tab doesn't even work now. It's so like right now, if you, if you hit left, right, if I'm hitting down, see, it's just like cycling through the, all these widgets in a really like unintuitive, dumb way. Uh, so I need to make that do something better by default, but I kind of, I tacked some stuff on there to try to help with that. Like one of the things is called auto select. And I think you'll see most widgets have this turned on or a lot of them do at least, but it's just a, it's available for most widgets. It's just auto select equals true. I'm gonna turn that on for the checkbox and for the button widget auto select equals true and what that does is it means that like when you hit up left or down or right or whatever when you have that widget selected it will try to you know select the one to the right of it or the left of it or you know it'll try to like do the smart thing which sometimes works reasonably and sometimes works terribly <laughs> so you have to kind of test it out so I'm gonna come in and see like how that's working settings advanced Okay, so now that I'm testing it, so I can see like I can press down and up. Auto select seems to be working here. I can get to the, I can navigate between plugins. But left, okay, left gets me here, but right should be getting me to that button and it's not. So I need to figure that out. Auto select equals true. The algorithm is not especially smart, like if things are not quite even with each other, if one thing's a little lower than the other, sometimes it won't find it. Sometimes you have to like explicitly set this up. Um, and so maybe, I'll just show you how that works real quick, like explicitly setting stuff up. Um, yeah, right widget equals, exactly. So you'll see code like this scattered throughout the UI code where it's like ba.widget. So this is doing, ba.widget is kind of like, you can call this on any widget to edit the widget and set its down widget to something. And basically what this, this should just be like a widget dot down widget equals check. But you know, you have to call this, this kind of funny, funny form of it. Um, but yeah, so if we do check equals the checkbox window or widget and then button equals the button widget, reformat that, then we should just be able to do something like uh, b dot widget edit equals check right widget equals button. So save that, launch the game. 
And you'll see we'll probably, even if this does work, we probably have to do one other thing then. So plugins. Okay, why is this, this is not working. Why is this not working? If I'm hitting right, there could be, stuff like this is kind of tricky to debug because in some cases like widgets will swallow like left, right selections. This probably is happening here actually. And <laughs> I always have to like go through and try to remember like how, or try to figure out how this stuff works. But I think, yeah, like one of the widgets that this is embedded in is probably like capturing the left, right press. So it could be the scroll widget or the container widget. Like I have a feeling it might be the scroll widget. So if we go to the scroll widget here, um, if this brings up, will this bring up all the, okay. These have a, a ton of potential arguments. They're very, very long and ugly, uh, but there's, oh yeah. One of these is claims left, right, bool. So we can do claims left, right equals, I forgot if, I even forget which way this goes. I think if it doesn't, if by default, I think maybe left, right presses will pass through it and like go to the next widget to the left or right of the scroll widget. Oh, there we go, okay. So claims left, right, basically by setting that value, we basically told this scroll widget like left, right clicks or left, right presses get passed down to your sub widgets. Like they don't, I think normally it would um, select the next like top level widget, like the so the selection would leave the scroll area and go to the next top level widget or something. I forgot exactly. It's it's kind of unintuitive behavior, but if you find you're not able to, and actually we probably in this case we probably didn't actually need this explicit assignment down here, where we told uh, where was that where we told the edit widget that it's right widget is button. Like it probably was doing the right thing. It's just those, those left, right presses were getting, um, not getting passed down. Okay, so settings, advanced, one more time. Okay, so now, yeah, now it's, it seems to be reasonable. I can navigate through all these with the keyboard. And um, so kind of at this point, there, there there's a few things I won't like, go through polishing because this this will take a little bit of polishing. There's, there's a few things that we would need to do here. One of them is, of course, have this test button actually, instead of test, it should be settings, of course. So you know, for now, we can just do settings. I'll make it caps so we know it's temporary um, and make it look a little nicer. So it looks like, uh, let's maybe make it a little taller. <laughs> maybe that'll center things and then we probably you know, can offset the, the Y by a few pixels or something just, you know, to kind of like visually line things up. That's kind of like part of the last, the last pass is making sure things are, are pretty. So, okay. Yeah, it looks, it looks a little bit ugly. One thing you'll find you get different like button styles depending on, like this is kind of a wide button. Um, if your button is a little bit like more square, it'll give you a, a different looking button. So you can kind of like play around with that. So let's, I'll take it up to like 40, see what this looks like. Oh, no, nope, still the same one. Let's try 50 at some point, or I'll make it a little less wide. Because it tries to like assign one of the button textures, which is, you know, sort of correct for for that size button. Oh no, it's still doing the weird thing, huh? But like, if you get a real thin button, it'll start to look something like this, or you get like a different, uh, give a different look to it. Okay, I'll have to look into that more, see what's what's happening there. But for now, I'll just leave it at, at forty. So. Um, and then, yeah, like for polishing this up, I mean, there's a number of things you need to polish. One, you would, you'd want to assign this button to uh, open the settings for that plugin. So that's, I won't get into that now, but basically we'll just, we'll want to go into like the, the plugin class, 
Maybe I'll just show briefly, but it's getting close to, I think, out of time here. Yeah, we're almost at noon, so I should wrap this up. Uh, but in the plugin class, if you're defining a plugin, there's different. Yeah, so here's like a user plugin. Basically, you know, you have different things that your plugin gets called for, like when the app is running, when the app pauses. Uh, we would want one down here, like on settings press or something. So then your plugin can like bring up its settings window and allow the user to configure whatever. So that I'll, we'll add that. And then we probably add another like support settings or, you know, some way where we can ask the plugin like, hey, do you have settings available? And then what we'd want to do is down here, we would only want to make this button visible or yeah, maybe only make the button if that plugin has settings. So we just do like if whatever, uh, avail plug dot, we'll probably have to add this, like has settings. <laughs> oh, I don't need parentheses there, I forgot them in Python. You know, it'd be something like this, where we would only create settings, the settings button for plugins that had the settings. And then we would also like set like the, the button action, which is action, I've, yeah, I forgot. Uh, or on on press on slow no 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 no. It's, you can tell it's been a little while since I've done uh, been writing UI stuff, so I forget what on activate call yeah. So we do on activate call equals you know bring whatever that plugin says its settings or you know call that you know activate or uh, show settings function for that particular plugin. Um, but that's largely it then. So I'll go ahead and I'll polish this stuff up and make it a bit prettier and then I can check it in. So this will be another thing in 1.3.11, or 1. <laughs> whatever we're on, 1.4.11. Oh my God, 1.7.11, Jesus, my brain is fried today. Um, and then, yeah, other stuff. Uh, again, I'm, I'm hoping someday to redo UI stuff to where you, know, you don't have to do as much, or you know, it, it's a little bit easier to write this sort of stuff without having to like, finesse things as much. Like if we get the row and column widgets behaving better to where you know you could do something like this with row and column widgets. And also right now it's impossible for me to, it's impossible for me to get back to the back button. <laughs> so in a case like this, you probably have to assign, you, know, you have to do that explicit like left, uh, right widget, left widget sort of thing. You'd have to like explicitly say that, you know, the up widget from here is the back button. Because you always want these UIs, because the game is intended to be played like on a keyboard or on a console or something where people just have controllers, like it's important to make sure that you can kind of get everywhere just using arrow keys and return. And like right now, I can't actually get out of here. <laughs> I think if I press escape, it still works. But you don't want to rely on that because some people might not be on a keyboard where they have escape. Um, you know, you might have just have like a simple game pad where all you have is basically arrows and buttons. I guess on the game pad, you, you can still hit escape. I think it's still like the, the the rightmost button still works as kind of back by default. But but anyway, it's it's good to be able to navigate everywhere. So the one thing you'd want to do is add like a, you know, up explicit, you know, up control telling the first widget here to go to there. And then also making sure that things work like if there's no plugins, because like it can be the case where you, you can get stuck like with the scroll window selected or something like that. So there's just little bits of like polish that sometimes you have to go through. Oh, and then lastly, once we're done, once we have this thing working, we want to hide that background. So I'll just do that now. So we'll go up background equals false. And I'll run that again. And go down to plugins. Okay. So here now, all right, now this is starting to look decently reasonable. So we have our, our list of plugins, settings for those plugins, and you know, after a bit of tweaking, we'd be able to <laughs> get out of this window. So that's, I guess that's that for now. I'm gonna, I'll go ahead and polish the rest of this up, as I said, and I'll check this stuff in, but I hope that was kind of helpful for people. Um, you know, just to kind of see like the weird kind of quirks of Bomb Squad UI stuff, so. Anyway, we should probably, I guess, wrap up soon. It's about noon, so that's usually kind of when we end. Um, anyone have any questions about any of that? So, cool, glad, yeah, I hope you, some of you guys enjoyed that. I was <laughs> probably a, a lot of, yeah, 
kind of iterating on the, the same little little few lines of code, but it's that's basically how I work on UI stuff. I just kind of like go bit by bit and try to you know get pieces in place, and once they're in place, I try to like finesse them and you know polish the polish the look of it so it, you know the alignment and the sizes look decent, and then you know get the functionality wired up on top of that. So cool, yeah. Maybe I'll. Uh, I mean, I guess this would be a long video on YouTube. It'll be like two hours, I guess, but I was doing like code demos for most of it, so maybe it would be useful. So maybe I'll just post this whole thing on YouTube if they allow that. <laughs> It'll take a while to prep, I'm sure. So. All right, any last questions? Level two, hooray! <laughs> cool, cool. All right, well, I'm gonna go grab some lunch then and I'll get this thing uploading. And so thanks everyone for, for tuning in, the, those of you that stuck it out to the end here. <laughs> I know it's, it's kind of a, a long session, so it's fine. Um, but anyway, I will talk to you folks later.